Hi, friends. We're going to be reading a book today. It is called The Case of the Disappearing Dinosaur. I don't know if we'll finish the whole book today, but I will start it and then we will continue throughout the week with the book. Chapter 1 It was a perfect Saturday afternoon. Blue sky, no clouds, no worries. One of those days you'd like to slide into a Xerox machine and copy 365 times. You could call it a year, and every day would be Saturday. Too bad I was stuck inside, sitting on Donica Starling's living room floor. I was doing a lot of nothing much and pretended to be happy about it. Suddenly, Donica swept into the room wearing a top hat and cape. She beamed while Mila and I politely applauded. Off to the side. Lucy Hiller frowned unhappily. Nuh-uh, Lucy said. Your entrance still needs something. It's got no style, no zip. What do you mean, no zip? Donica complained. I haven't even started my magic act yet. You're taking the stage, Donica, Lucy stated. You're putting on a big show. You've got to grab the audience's attention right away. Lucy, I groaned. She's rehearsing for a birthday party. What do you expect? Flashing lights and stink bombs? Jigsaw, you're a wonderful detective, but leave the magic act to us. Lucy commented. Suddenly, her eyes lit up. I've got it. Donica, you need a snazzy opening. Something peppy and fun. With loud music, you know, big drums and electric guitars. And this time, I'll give you a snappy introduction. Lucy gently pushed Donica out of the room. Come in after I announce you, she instructed. Donica did as she was told. Then, Lucy, all curls and big eyes, turned to Mila and me. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, she boomed. It is time for our incredible magic show. Please put your hands together for Donica the Great. At that instant, Lucy raced to the stereo and blasted music from Why. WFLY92, the station with all the hits and none of the misses. Boom, boom, boom. Loud music rocked the walls. I plugged my fingers in my ears. Once again, Donica swept into the room, her cape flowing behind her. Lucy cut the music and clapped. Fabulous, fabulous. That's much better. She exclaimed, don't you agree, Mila? Mila nodded happily. I can't wait until the party tomorrow. I am waiting, I pointed out, and I'm getting bored, too. I thought we were going to play baseball. In a minute, Jigsaw, Mila shushed. First, Donica needs an audience so she can practice her magic act. I've got a magic trick, I mumbled. How about if we disappear? I felt a sharp pain in my ribs. I guess baseball would have to wait. Yeesh, Mila had pointy elbows. Did someone say disappear, Lucy asked. Uh, never mind, I said. That's our big trick, when we really do make something disappear. Lucy winked at Donica, but it's an extra special trick. We're not showing you that one today. Donica raised her hands to silence the chatter. She told us, I'm not only a magician, I'm also a mind reader. But I'll need the help of the audience. Donica explained that she would turn her back. We could then take a, any coin, a penny, nickel, dime, or quarter, and give it to her assistant, Lucy. I fished a nickel from my pocket. Lucy put it on the table and placed a coffee cup over it. You can turn around now, Donica, Lucy hollered. Donica stared at the ceiling. She rubbed her eyes and strained under the effort. Please, she hissed, you must all concentrate on the coin. I will read your minds. Donica haltingly murmured, the answer is a nickel. Again, I demanded. This time, I handed Lucy a dime. Once more, Donica asked us to concentrate. Well, Mila must have thought about that dime pretty hard, because all I was thinking was, how did Donica pull off that trick? 
Hmm, Donica said, biting her lip. This is very difficult. She glanced at the cup and closed her eyes. I see it now, she said. The answer is a dime. Chapter 2, Lost and Found Mila and I left for the park about 15 minutes later. Actually, Lucy kicked us out. We've still got a few more tricks to practice on our own, Lucy told us. Don't want to reveal our amazing secrets. Mila seemed disappointed. I slapped a baseball into my glove and I pulled down my hat. We are out of here, I blurted. On the way to Lincoln Park, Mila said, she's pretty good, don't you think, Jigsaw? I'm not a big fan of magic, I confessed. I feel like it's cheating, like everything is one big trick. Duh, Mila replied. That's the whole idea, isn't it? How do you think Donica did that mind reading act? I was wondering about that, I said. It must be a code or something. I figure that Lucy gives her a secret signal. Or maybe she really can read minds, Mila suggested. Maybe cats can ride pogo sticks. But I kind of doubt it. That mind reading act is as fake as a rubber chicken that lays scrambled eggs. I only wish I could figure out how Danica does it. We spent the next half hour catching flies on the soggy grass. No, not the flies with wings and creepy suction feet. I'm a kid, not a frog. I was using me I was using my signature Alex Rodriguez baseball glove, not a long sticky tongue. I threw the baseball in a high long arc to Mila. She drifted back and caught it easily. Mila is a pretty good ball player. She is also my partner. We're detectives. For a dollar a day, we make problems go away. We found missing hamsters, stolen bicycles, runaway dogs, and brownie bandits. But today, we were catching baseballs, not bad guys. That is, until Joey Pignato and Ralphie Jordan came running over. We've been searching all over for you guys, Joey wheezed. You should have looked here first. It would have saved you some time. Huh? Ignore him, Joey, Mila said. What's up? Joey pulled a coin purse from his jeans pocket. The purse was made of red satin with a little silver cup on the top. Go ahead, Joey. Show him, Ralphie urged. So Joey showed us. He opened the purse and all I saw was green. Lots of green. The color of money. Mila whistled softly. Where did you get this? We found it on the way to the candy store, Joey said excitedly. It was on the ground, just sitting there, doing nothing. I held out my hand. May I? I emptied the purse onto the ground. Out spilled a red lipstick, a few rubber bands, 37 cents in change, and a scrap of paper, two ticket stubs, and a gang of Ted presidents. That is pictures of dead presidents. Two portraits of Andrew Jackson, three of Abraham Lincoln, and eight George Washingtons. In other words, $63. I eyed Joey closely. What do you plan on doing with this money? We've got to find the owner, Joey said, eyes unblinking. That's why I came to you. Good answer, Joey, but you know our rates. We get a dollar a day, I reminded him. Joey frowned. I'm not made of money, Jigsaw. Besides, I just spent my whole allowance on candy. There will probably be a reward when we return it, Ralphie said. Maybe you could split it with us. We shook hands and called it a deal. Baseball would have to wait, because Joey Pignato had just thrown us a fat pitch right over the plate. We had to take a swing at it. Chapter 3, Lining Up the Clues Mila looked over the contents of the purse. She folded the money neatly and placed it back inside the purse. She returned the rubber bands, lipstick, loose change, and then snapped the purse shut. What about the rest? Joey wondered. Mila didn't answer. Instead, she read a piece of paper. It was a list, written in a sloppy scrawl. Is that a clue? Ralphie asked. It's a shopping list, Mila replied. 
and a clue. So is this. I pointed at the blue ticket stub. Too bad it's been ripped in half. I'm not sure if we can read all the words. It says wrapping paper, tape, card, candles, pick up cake. And then it says Turpan 11 0. So they're still waiting on the other half of where this ticket stub is. Joey peered over my shoulder. What's a Turpan? The play Peter Pan has been showing this week at the Steamer 10 Theater. I answered, I know because my sister Hillary's in it. She plays one of the Lost Boys, go figure. Anyway, it's all she's been talking about for weeks. Mila pulled on her long black hair. March 11th, that's yesterday. But how's all this going to help us find the lady who lost the purse, Joey asked. Mysteries are like jigsaw puzzles, I told Joey. You keep looking at the pieces until they fit together. That's how you solve the case. For example, you said it was a lady's purse. We don't know that for sure. But most men don't carry purses, and I don't know any who wear red lipstick. And no kid carries around that kind of cash, Ralphie noted. Holding the purse in her hand, Mila concluded, The person who lost this purse probably went to see Peter Pan last night. She studied the ticket stub and read aloud, I-N-E-E -E only? It could be the row, Joey suggested, like you were only allowed to sit in row E-E. -E. Before I could reply to that, a shout startled me. Hey, you rats, give me back my mother's money. Bobby Solovsky jumped off his bicycle, letting it crash into the ground. I'll take that purse, he demanded. It belongs to my mom. Bobby snatched out the purse. Not so fast, cowboy, I said, stepping between Bobby and the purse. You'll have to prove it first. The first time I met Bobby Solovsky, I caught him trying to steal cheese doodles from my lunchbox. That was way back in preschool, but some things never change. Like my dad says, a zebra can't change his stripes, and Bobby Solovsky can't change his ways. He was as crooked as a plate of wet spaghetti and twice as slippery. <laughs> Chapter 4. Something Fishy Prove it, Bobby repeated, his voice rising in disbelief. Prove it. The tips of his ears turned red with anger. Prove it was not what Bobby wanted to hear. Still looking for the four of us standing across from him, Bobby saw there would be no other way. Okay, I will prove it, he finally snapped back. Good, I answered. What was in the purse? Money. Gobs of it, Bobby replied. My... Mom's money, and I want it back, every stinking penny. I let out a slow, sleepy yawn. Ho hum, anyone could have guessed that, Solovsky. What else was in the purse? A smile visited Bobby's face. It looked lost there, like a tourist who'd taken the wrong bus. Smiles don't usually find their way to Bobby's face. Smirks and sneers, yes, smiles, nope, not often. I repeated the question to Solovsky. He paused thinking it over. Oh, yeah, I remember, Bobby said. Tickets. My mom and me went to see Peter Pan last night. There it was, that same fishy smile swimming across his face. I didn't like the look of it. You? I exclaimed. Peter Pan? Bobby folded his arms across a New York Yankees t-shirt. Yeah, I always like Twinkle Bell. Tinker Bell, Mila corrected. Whatever, Solovsky snorted. Just hand over the green stuff. Sorry, Solovsky, I can't do that. There's something fishy about your story. What do fish have to do with this, Bobby protested. Both smell, I replied. I turned to Joey. Who else knows about this purse you found? Nobody, Joey answered. He bit his lip, except, uh... Maybe Mike Radcliffe and Eddie Becker, Ralphie added, and Githanair and Kim Lewis and... 
I raised my hand. Hold on. Is there anyone you didn't tell? Ralphie pointed at Bobby. Yeah, him. I knew that Mike Radcliffe was Bobby Solovsky's best friend, so I asked. Did you show Mike and the others what was inside the purse? Joey nodded and shapelessly bleated. Yes. Did I mess up? Mike Radcliffe is Bobby's neighbor, I pointed out. He could have easily told Bobby about the purse and what was inside it. So what, Bobby protested, a spray of split spewed from his mouth. If I needed a shower, I would have taken one at home. Mike is my friend, Bobby said. Besides, it wasn't a secret. So what if he did tell me about the purse? Mike's a good guy. Obviously, you rats wanted to keep the money for yourselves. Save your breath, Solovsky. You're wasting air, I said. This is not your mom's purse. And you never went to see Peter Pan last night. How would you know, Bobby challenged. I swung an imaginary baseball bat in my hands. First, it's Tinkerbell, not Twinkle Bell. That's strike one. Anyone can make a little mistake, Bobby said. I shrugged. Yes, maybe no. Second, you said the play you said you saw the play last night. But look at the rip ticket. It says I N E E. The first three letters are missing are M A T. That ticket is for the matinee only. Bobby stared blankly. I could tell I'd reached the outer limits of his vocabulary. A matinee is an afternoon show, Mila explained. You said you went last night. You lied, Solovsky. I swung the imaginary bat once again. Strike three, Bobby. You just whiffled the bases loaded. Solofi scratched his head, muttering to himself. He was trying to think of a clever reply, but it looked like it put a strain on his brain. Finally, Bobby pointed at me and cried, I'll get you back for this, Jigsaw Jones. Sooner or later, I'll make you pay. We watched him right off in silence. Then Ralphie slapped me on the back. Great work, Jigsaw. Joey still seemed troubled. Then whose purse is it? The shopping list might give us the answer, Mila said. Follow me, guys. I've got an idea. And tomorrow we will pick back up and find out whose purse it is.